across the country. Uh, 50 percent of the participants from outside the state and 50 percent of the participants from uh, uh, within Tamil Nadu. Sir. So most of them are uh, PhD students. Uh, three, four are young scientists and uh, two, three uh, postgraduate students. Sir. This is the composition of the uh, participants. Sir. So uh, 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 to the participants, uh, a formal. Uh, Introduction about the uh, resource person. Uh, today we have uh, uh, Professor uh, Vasuhi B. Uh, Belawadi. Actually, currently he is uh, in uh, GKVK uh, as ICA, ICAR uh, Emeritus Scientist in the Department of Entomology. Uh, professor is uh, having uh, experience, vast experience uh, in pollination ecology. Uh, more than uh, three, three decades. So uh, he's, uh, re he received many awards and honors, including visiting FBAO Fellow, University of uh, Southampton, UK, Fellow of the Royal Entomology Society London, and uh, a member of QRT to review AICRP on honeybees and pollinators. So he's having vast teaching experience, uh, guided 14 PhDs, and uh, uh, 15 uh, MSc students. He guided a uh, uh, Fulbright Fellow from uh, Emory, uh, USA. So, for to his credit, uh, he has published more than 100 research papers and uh, a dozen of uh, popular articles, two books, and two manuals, uh, around 100 uh, guest lectures. So. Uh, I request the participants uh, to make use of uh, his expertise on uh, pollination ecology and pollination uh, network. With these few words, I uh, handed over uh, the session to uh, Professor uh, Belawadi for this lecture. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. For, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. I'll share my screen. I'll start the presentation. Okay, is the uh, slide visible? Yes, sir. Okay, yeah. Okay. Well, uh, the topic that I was supposed to give in today's lecture is bee taxonomy, diversity, and conservation. So I'll be sp speaking a little bit about how the uh, relationship between the plants and the bees evolved in the first place. What is the diversity of bees that we have? in India and in the world in general, and why we need to conserve bees, and what is, what is the uh, main uh, reason why we should concentrate on conserving the bees. So these are the things that I will be speaking on. So you, you know that the flowering plants appeared about 130 to 160 million years ago. Uh, in fact, Dave Gulson, in one of his books published in 2014, in the day, uh, makes a very obvious statement that sex has always been difficult for plants because they cannot move, they are sustained. Now, if one cannot move, then finding a suitable partner for reproduction becomes almost impossible. But we know that there is self-pollination, but the, uh, there are problems with uh, disadvantages with uh, self-pollination. You know that self-pollination leads to low or very little variability, and populations may succumb to biotic or abiotic stresses, and there is no question of survival of the fittest in self-pollination because all, almost all the, the entire population will be uniform. And so plants have to invariably depend on what are called as sex facilitators, some agents for transferring their pollen to the stigma of other flowers. About 135 million years ago, plants discovered wind pollination. And the problem with wind pollination is that the plant needs to produce a very large number of pollen grains. There is a low success rate because the chances of the pollen reaching the right stigma is very, very low, and majority of the pollen goes waste. So the energy that is spent on pollen production is very, very high. And between 130 and 120 million years ago, some insects discovered that pollen grains are edible and nutritious. Some winged insects, like beetles, began feeding on it, and before long, they became specialists in eating pollen. 
uh, when they started moving from plant to plant in search of the food that is pollen, they accidentally also carried pollen grains on their bodies, trapped among the hairs in the joints between their segments. And occasionally, when a pollen grain fell off the insect onto the female part of the flower, that flower was pollinated. And probably this was the beginning of the insect mediated cross pollination. Although much of the pollen was consumed by insects, this was still a vast improvement over their dependency on wind. So plants soon learned that uh, the advantage of there is advantage of uh, encouraging insects to visiting their flowers. Plants were benefited since pollination was assured when the insects were visiting, but still there was a problem. There was difficulty in locating the flowers because you know that they, all the early flowers were also very similar to the foliage because flowers, of course, are modified foliage. So they were also greenish in color in the beginning. So it was difficult for the, these insects to locate the flowers. So in order to attract insects, they had to get better and advertise their flowers with a different color than the surrounding vegetation. And probably this happened as, a, as, a, as a, some kind of a chance uh, or through some mutation. Early lilies and magnolias were the first plants to evolve petals conspicuously white against the greenish vegetation. And this probably is the beginning uh, of the advertisement campaign. So thus began a selection for flower color. The second trick that the plants adopted was offering sugar-rich nectar as an extra reward, possibly to save pollen. Again, because the insects were feeding a large, large number of pollen, so the nectar actually came out as an accidental discovery in plants. So with a new reliable means of pollination, insect pollinated plants became enormously successful and diversified. Now there was also specialization in insects and, they, and they, when, when they were offering nectar, the plants did not want the nectar to be wasted or robbed by insects which were not uh, actually pollinating those flowers. So they, they tried hiding the nectar in long corolla tubes and only those insects which, are, which have long tongue or the proboscis could only take that and they were also efficient pollinators. So there was specialization in insects like moths, butterflies and flies that evolved long tubular mouth parts to suck up the nectar and they were also efficient as pollinators. Now this was the time when the most specialized and successful group of insects emerged which is, which is, which is the group of bees. Bees are considered to be the masters of gathering nectar and pollen to this day. And the first true bees appeared between 132 and 113 million years ago. Now, competition for pollinators, in fact, resulted in selection for brighter colors, patterns, elaborate shapes, and variations in quantity and quality of rewards offered by the flowers. So this is a competition that was induced by the pollinators among the plant populations. And this actually led to a sudden increase in speciation among plants when they started adapting to these kinds of competition. Now, this is what is referred to as pollinator mediated speciation in angiosperms. Now, today, if we have, if we go out and then see hundreds and thousands of species of plants of various colored shapes and sizes of flowers, it is probably because of the pollinator mediated selection. Pollination is an essential service for, to crops and wild plants. And uh, pollinators are vectors of genetic exchange. Pollination is an essential service to crops and wild plants and pollinators are vectors for genetic exchange. And they're essential in obligate mutualisms. Obligate mutualisms do occur in many species, many species space, like the fig and the fig wasps. There are about 800 species of figs in the world and there are nearly 800 species of fig wasps. So each species of fig depends on a particular species of fig wasp. And the fig cannot produce seeds if the fig wasps are not there and the fig wasps cannot sur survive if the fig is not there because they breed inside the flowers of figs. So there is an obligate mutualism. And they also provide ecosystem services, other ecosystem services. Like in the wild, there are so many fruits that are produced as a result of pollination service by the pollinators, by the bees and other pollinators, which, result, which help in survival of several species of birds and also several animals. And of course, 
pollinators have a biodiversity value. Now today we have a very high biodiversity in any given part of the world. It is probably because of the pollinators. Because of the pollinators, we have so many plants. Because of so because we have so many plants, we have so many species of animals that depend animals and birds that depend on those plants. So supposing if the pollinators were not there, we would not have had one of the wonderful spices that we consume very often, that is the cardamom, or we would not have would, would not taste coffee also if the, if the bees are not there and probably if the pollinators were not there maybe we would not have enjoyed so many fruits and vegetables that we enjoy daily now coming to the bees why why we have to worry about bees the word bee is almost synonymous with pollinator so when we when when somebody hears the word the term pollinator he immediately thinks about bees it's because bees are the major pollinators of a majority of the plants around us. And when we hear the word bee, we think only about honeybees. That's because we are tuned to think about honeybees because we get honey. But we do not think that honeybees are major pollinators also and that there are many other bees. But in the world, there are something like 20,507 species of bees and there may be more than 25,000 species. So we have 20,500 species of bees in the world of which only about 11 or 12 species are the honeybees and all the remaining bees are solitary bees. And they are all excellent pollinators of many of the crops and wild plants. In India, we have 727 species of bees, which is about 3.5% of the world bee fauna. Now, we, we know that India represents nearly 7% of the diversity, biodiversity, when you compare it to the world biodiversity. But when you look at the bee species, we see that are only 3.5%, which means that there may be many more species which are waiting to be found, discovered, and named. There may be a lot of work for bee taxonomists. Now, coming to the identification of bees or the taxonomy of bees, as the title of my talk says, Bees belong to the order Hymenoptera and superfamily Apoidea. In the superfamily Apoidea, there are two groups, Spiciformis and Apiformis. Spiciformis includes all the sphicoid wasps and Apiformis includes all bees. So bees are closely related to sphicoid wasps. The main difference between these two groups is that sphicoid wasps are all carnivores. That means they feed on other insects, they predate on other insects. Uh, that means they actually, they are also solitary nesters. They cut, so construct nests and then take care of their young ones, like the bees, but they provide their young ones with uh, other insects, uh, which they collect, or spiders that they collect. They paralyze these insects and then bring it to the, their nest and then lay an egg on, on that. And the young one, which hatches from the egg, feeds on this prey and then it develops. As adults, the spicoid wasps do visit flowers for, the, for their own survival, they take nectar. And bees actually are entirely different from in this behavior because they are all, they are all vegetarian, we can say, because they feed mainly on pollen and nectar. They rear their young ones with a mixture of only pollen and nectar. So this is the major difference in their behavior. But when it comes to the, uh, the morphological difference, Bees have both these spicoid wasps and also bees, they have hairs on the body. The hairs on the body of a bees are branched. So that is the main difference. Whereas the hairs on spicoid wasps is very minute or it is not branched. So that is, that is how we can actually differentiate the wasp from a bee. Now, the, uh, when we come to the bees of India, so in, in the world there are the bees uh, have about seven families. Antonidae, Apidae, Colletidae, Halictidae, Megachylidae, Melitidae, and Stenotritidae. These are the seven families. And of these, in India, we have representations in six families. Stenotritidae does not occur in India, or it has not been recorded so far from India. We have representatives of Antonidae, Apidae, Colletidae, Halictidae, Megachylidae, and Melitidae. Now, when it comes to the number of genera, in the world, there are 528 genera of bees and of this we have in India 70 genera. That means 14% of the genera are represented in India. Now the most, uh, say the maximum number of genera are in Metachylidae 27 genera, in Apidae we have 24 genera and in Halictidae we have 14 genera. 
but the remaining three families are very small. Andenidae is represented by a single genus, Colitidae by two genera, and Melitidae by two genera. Now, when it comes to the species, in the world, as I said, we have 20,507 species, and in India, we have 727 species. And again, Apidae, Halictidae, and Megacalidae are the most species families in India. So Megacalidae is represented by 229 species, Apidae by 223 species, and Halictidae by 219 species. And the remaining three families are represented by not very few species, like Melitidae by only four species, Colitidae by 31 species, and Antonidae by 21 species. Now, how to identify these families? So when it comes to taxonomy, we need to know how we can identify a megachylid from an apid and the different families. I'll just give up to the families, key to the families. So the bees can be grouped into two major categories as long-tongued bees and short-tongued bees. Long-tongued bees have long, uh, say, proboscis, and here the labial pulp has four segments, and the first two segments of the labial pulp are longer compared to the remaining two segments. The remaining two segments are very, very short. And this you have in Apidae and Megachylidae. And in short-tongued bees, you have the proboscis is short, labial pulp, though it has four segments, all segments are small and are equal in size. So this is, this is the labial pulp. And the remaining four families of India, Colitidae, Andenidae, Halitidae, and Melitidae come under this group, short-tongued bees. Now, Apidae and Megachylidae are differentiated by the way they carry pollen. So the hairs are present on the hind leg to carry pollen in Apidae. The hind legs are modified, the femur and the first tarsal segments, these are modified for carrying pollen. There is what is called as a pollen basket here with which they actually carry pollen to their nest. Whereas in Megachylidae, the pollen basket is absent, but the hairs are present on the ventral aspect of the abdomen. So this is called as a scopae. And when the bee visits flowers, the, 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 it, it collects pollen here on the ventral aspect. And when it goes, goes back to the nest, it, it removes this pollen, it combs this pollen out and then put it in its cell in the nest. And another important difference is that in Apidae, the submarginal, there are three submarginal cells in the forewing, whereas in Megachylidae, there are two submarginal cells in the forewing. Then similarly, in Colletidae, between Colletidae and Antonidae, the glossa is, glossa is the terminal part of the proboscis. It is bilobed, whereas it is pointed in Antonidae. And in between Halictidae and uh, Melitidae, there is a basal vein which is arched in Halictidae, whereas in Melitidae, the basal vein is almost trite. So this is some uh, basic uh, characters by which you can identify the families. Now, as I said, the Apidae has 223 species and 24 genera. And of this, the most species genus is Bombus. Bombus, we have recorded 53 species. It's, it is mainly because there are some excellent taxonomists which are working on bumblebees. Bombus is, uh, is a genus of bumblebees. And there are 53 species recorded from India, mainly from the Himalayas, Himachal Pradesh, and other, other parts. And Xylocopa is another genus in which we have 28 species. And the other species, other genus is Saratina with 21 species, Amegala with 19 species, and Nomada with 20 species. And for the remaining uh, genera, we have representations with only one or two species, or at the most seven or eight species. So this probably, I'll come to, I'll, I'll again, I may again repeat this statement. This is probably because of the less number of taxonomists working in this group, and also the collections that, that we have from different parts of the country. So similarly, in Halic today, we have 219 species in 14 genera, and maximum number of species are recorded in Lasioglossum and Lipotrichus. So these are um, solid, all these are solitary bees. Whereas um, in, in the previous one, sorry, in, in, when you go back to Apidae, in Apidae, you have in the genus Apis, you have the social bees, the honeybees, and in Bombus, there are a few which are semi-social, and all the and in Xylocopa, you may find a few species which are semi-social, and all the others are solitary bees. 
and again in halictidae all are solitary bees and in megachylidae includes the leaf cutter bees and resin bees leaf cutter they are called resin bees because they cut pieces of leaves and they use this leaf, leaf bits to line their cells when they construct the cell when they construct their nest so the most species genus is megachyle the genus megachyle has 93 species and this is one of the major group of pollinators also very important pollinators of several crops and several plants and you have so many species 27 genera and 229 species is megachyle day as i said megachyle is a genus with leaf cutter of leaf cutter bees and there is a genus anthidium which actually are referred to as resin bees that means they actually collect resins from oozing out of the trees tree exudates and then they use that for lining their cells okay so these are different things behaviors that you see among this these solitary bees then the remaining three smaller families antennidae collectidae and melitidae as i said antenna is antennidae is represented by a single genus antenna with 21 species collectidae with two genera collectus and hyalias with 13 and 18 species and melitidae with only four species in two genera Dasypoda with one species and Melita with three species. So this is in general about the diversity of bees that we have. Now to tell you about the importance of bees as pollinators and why we need to conserve them, I use three examples you know, on which we have worked. My, my group has uh, worked more recently. Uh, to drive home the point of the importance of these bees as pollinators. Pigeon pea, musk melon, and sun hat. So these are the three plants, these are the three crops that I am using. Now, uh, the reason that I am using is, uh, except musk melon, pigeon pea and sun hat, they are actually pollinated by solitary bees, the, mainly megachylates, and musk melon is pollinated by honey bees. Okay, so we, we know the differences also, that solitary bees also are important. And I also try to make an attempt to estimate the value of pollination service, which is necessary to justify why we need to conserve bees. What is the value of the pollination service? If we, unless we know that, we do not give any uh, justification why we need to conserve bees. Now, pigeon pea is Kajanas Kajan. It is originated in southern or eastern India, cultivated in over 50 tropical and subtropical countries around the world. And it has a very high nutritional value because it is a major source of protein for vegetarians. And the food and national security of developing countries mainly depends on a crop like pigeon pea. Now, I often used to tell my students that pigeon pea can be called a princess of the crop of pulses because without pigeon pea, I think no Indian family will have lunch or dinner. Without, without dal, we will not have lunch or dinner. So it, it is the most, most important ingredient or member in, in the family. So that's the reason why I prefer to call it as a princess of uh, pulses. Now in India, we have 4.43 million hectares uh, and we produce about 4.25 million tons. Okay, the total production is about 4.25 million tons from 4.43 million hectares. Now the productivity is 950 kgs per hectare, which is low. Actually, the productivity is low because the potentiality for producing is up to 2,500 kg per hectare. Now there is a potentiality to enhance. Now the low productivity, some of the reasons that are often given are that there are a lot of insect pests which actually cause damage and because of that we have low productivity and pigeon pea also suffer, suffers from several disease causing organisms so that is the reason why we have low productivity but there can be another possible reason also which is inadequate knowledge of pollination the knowledge about pollination of pigeon pea is very low even among the literates or we consider if, the, if you look into the literature, you see that it is uh, given as often cross pollinated, and the range of cross pollination is given in some papers. It is only three percent. In some places, in some papers, it may go up to forty percent. But the pot set is low. You go and then look into the data of any pigeon pea grower. You see that the pot, pot set is less than thirty percent. Is it because of the pollinator deficit? Do we know what is the pollinator? 
and is there a deficit of pollinators or reduced number of pollinators so to understand the pollination biology we should know the floral biology of the crop also pigeon pea is said to be self compatible which means to say it is capable of setting seeds with self pollination by self pollination so there is a possibility of self pollination but it benefits from cross pollination when an, an agent visits the flowers and then carries pollen from other flowers to this the flower that it is visiting the cross pollination is affected and the cross pollination is beneficial for pigeon pea now if you look at the flower structure it is typically a papilionaceous flower with standard wing and keel petals now the interesting thing in all the papilionaceous flowers is that the um, the anthers and the style and stigma are hidden beneath the wing petal in the keel petal so if it has to come in contact with a pollinator it has to press the wing petal and then release those anthers and the uh, style and stigma to come in contact with with those structures so that that is the reason why we say that it is evolved for pollination by certain groups of insects certain groups of insects only and the stamens are 10 in diadelphous condition nine fused in a column and one is free so this this, this is the kind of uh, stamens that you see and ovary is superior subsessile flat dorsoventrally unilocular with five ovules stigma is capitate and nectaries are at the base of the style and the pollen ovule ratio is 1000 to 1 now when the pollen ovule ratio is such uh, around this it is said to be facultative xenogamy xenogamy you know that when it depends on other another agent like an insect and is also capable of uh, selfing selfing or say, setting seeds with self pollination so it, it is probably a facult adopted for facultative xenogamy now the interesting thing is the flowers of pigeon pea are visited by 18 species of insects including 12 species of bees now the question that we that we asked first is whether the flower visitors help in any way so what we did was we actually set, uh, had two sets of plants of 25 each one set of plants of 25 25 plants we caged them without allowing any flower visitor and we left another set open for flower visitors now interestingly we see that there is a greater number of pots setting in the open pollinated condition compared to the caged condition so under the caged condition whatever that is setting is because of self pollination and whatever is setting in the open condition the additional if we can say is because of the flower visitors so there is a significant increase in pot set in plants that were left open compared to caged plants and if flower visitors are helping what are these flower visitors so that is the next question so this is the most basic thing when you start working on pollination biology one of the first things that you should find out is whether the flower visitors help or helping in in any way so the major flower visitors we found that there are 12 species of bees though there were 18 species of insects visiting 12 species were bees and of these nine species belonged to the family apidae and three species belonged to megachylidae three species of genus megachyl megachyl donata hera and bicolor they visited and three species of apis dorsata floria and sarana the honey bees then four species of xylocopa the carpenter bees and ceratina bingami and tetragonula is the stingless bee ceratina bingami is another is a refer to as a sweat bee so these are the visitors okay but there was difference in the frequency of the visitation by these all of them were not equally uh, say uh, visit, visiting the uh, flowers of uh, pigeon bee so what we wanted to look at is which is the most significant flower visitor so we found that at least there are some six species which are more significant significantly visiting compared to the many others the remaining seven and of these apis floria and megachyl lanata were maximum come and then followed by xylocopa amethystina so the other three they were very very small in numbers compared to these so we thought that we will concentrate on these three species and then look at how they are effective as the in pot set so the, in the next experiment what we did was we had sets of plants with 
for open pollination and with closed under closed condition and then another seed with three sets we allowed visitation by uh, controlled visitation by only the set species like one set of flowers we allowed only megacallanata to visit and another set only xylocopa to visit and another set only apis floria to visit then when, when we looked at the person pot set the person pot set was not significantly different between no visits that means under the control condition with apis floria and xylocopa amethystina which means that these two species though they are visiting they, they are not helping in any way in increasing pollination but when you compare the visitation by megakyle lanata which is equal to the open open pollination or almost equal to the open pollination which shows that it is the megakyle lanata in the wild which is actually the best pollinator so this this is a better pollinator and we wanted to see are there more reasons to consider megakyle lanata as the best pollinator so megakyle lanata as i said is a leaf cutter bee it constructs nests it, it it's nests in existing hollows or tubes by carrying leaf bits and then it lines and it constructed cells inside and then in the cell it it uh, uh, it actually keeps a mixture of pollen and nectar and then over that it actually lays an egg and the egg hatches it feeds on the mixture of pollen and nectar and then it de develops so that is the biology of the leaf leaf cutter bee or megakyle species megakyle lanata now when we looked at the behavior of these three species we found that Megaka and Lanata actually spent least time in locating the flower, in searching the searching time, least searching time. And it also spent maximum number of flowers per unit time compared to Xelacopa and Apis Floria. Because Megaka and Lanata knew where the nectar is, how to land on the flower, and how to take nectar. So that is the reason why it was spending least time per flower, and that is the reason why it, it could visit more number of flowers per unit time. So it spent least time searching for flowers and visited maximum number of flowers per unit time. So when a megakyl lanata lands on the flower, it actually presses the uh, say wing, wing petals, holds the base of the standard petal with its mandibles, and then it presses the wing petal and the, the anther and the, the stamen and the style and stigma, they come out and then they press against the abdomen. The, you know that the megakyle have uh, megakyle species have hairs on the ventral aspect of the abdomen which come in contact with all this reproductive structure of the flower and that is how it is an efficient pollinator so megakyle is better equipped for pollination of pigeon pea now the next question was can pot set be improved by increasing leaf cutter bee population so we selected a plot with about 4800 plants and we placed 20 trap nests 10 meters apart. We placed 10, 20 uh, uh, trap nests 10, 10 meters apart, and each trap nest contained 12 to 15, 15 centimeter hollow, long hollow reeds. The reeds are Epomia species. It is a, it, it is a, it is a weed-like uh, plant which grows in in the uh, in any in any in many places. And the interesting thing is its stem is hollow. The stem is hollow. We can actually cut the stems and then dry them, cut into pieces of about six inches, and then put them in this kind of uh, PVC pipes and then hang them in the feed. And Megakyle accepts this for nesting. It, it nests inside these reeds. So totally, we had 720 reeds, of which about nearly about 30% of them were occupied by the Megakyle. So the population naturally was more. Population that was active in the field was more. And in the same plant, we had about 40 plants that are caged to exclude flower visitors. And we also had a control plant about 500 meters away, wherein we had not kept this, which was for natural open pollination. And when we we recorded the pot set in all these treatments, in all these three, three treatments. So an open, and we found that where we increased the megakyle population, in fact, there was almost an increase by double the e the, the pot set so compared to the open pollination the pot set in the um, in the in the plot where we introduced the trap nest and then increased the population of leaf cutter bees the, the the pot set was significantly higher 
So this very clearly, this is this is actually this has to be repeated. This is only a one-time study. Though pigeon pea is self-compatible, it is benefited by LCB visits, leaf cutter bee visits. The flower structure appears to have evolved for pollination by Macaque species. And by increasing the nesting sites for leaf cutter bees, we can actually increase the pot site significantly. There is a need to conserve leaf cutter bee populations and their nesting sites. Now, in many places, in many parts of the world, now there is a thing, what are, what are called as bee hotels, where they suggest that you keep this kind of structures with um, um, say nesting sites for the leaf cutter, leaf cutter bees and other solitary bees. And these are referred to as bee hotels. Well, before I move on to the next crop, if there are any questions, I'm ready to answer, please. Are there any questions? Like we have drones, uh, work, workers and uh, uh, queen yeah. being uh, active species. Yeah. Uh, so all other uh, this bees family they follow the same kind of uh, social uh, living system. Yeah, all they have the same social structure. Uh, they have the workers, they have a queen and they have a few drones, okay? You know that it is only the workers which are sterile females, which are the ones which actually work for the colony and the drones do not work. But these do not have that kind of a system, the solitary bees. A single female, it actually constructs the nest and then takes care of the young one. That's all. So there is no social behavior here. So that is the difference. Anything else? Any other questions? Sir? Yeah. Those bees are who have the social behavior and those bees don't have. There is any there is a difference between the pardon, pardon? Can you repeat the question? Sir, the, yeah. there is any difference on the pollination. Those bees have uh, the socialized behavior, and those who don't have the socialized behavior. There is any difference in the efficiency of pollination. Uh you mean the behavior, the social behavior between the social bees is it uh, no no sir huh. uh, between sir. the solitary bees and the social bees solitary bees you know that they are individuals okay uh, like you, you have a bee which constructs its own nest and then brings the uh, food and then keeps it in the uh, nest and then lays an egg on that and the egg hatches it it feeds on so like that it may bring it may have several nests and in each nest it may have several cells some six or seven cells it may construct like that as you see in case of uh, megachidex but in social bees it is completely different in social bees it is the queen that is laying eggs it is the workers which are actually constructing the nest cells and they are the ones which are going out and then bringing the food the pollen and nectar and their duty is only to collect and then put these things and the uh, the queen bee goes and then lays eggs so this is, this is how it is. Yeah. So there is a lot of difference between the social bees and the uh, solitary bees. The, uh, in in uh, pollination uh, thing, why people prefer to have social bees is that uh, you can, it is easy you know, to increase the numbers because in a colony there can be thousands of workers. Whereas solitary bees will be individuals and then to increase the number you, you will have so much more effort to give the nesting sites and all that so that's one thing but the most important thing is all crops or all plants may not be equally pollinated by the social bees so some of them will be uh, uh, some of them are say evolved for pollination by certain solitary bees only so they will not be um, say benefited by social bee visits. so that is the third thing yeah Okay, shall I move on? Yes, sir. To the next example. Yeah. Yeah, the next one is pollination muskmelon, where you see that the muskmelon is pollinated by social bees. So muskmelon is andromonaceous. Okay, andromonaceous means you have the hermaphrodite flowers and you also have staminate flowers. Okay, so this is a very interesting uh, crop. So you have the hermaphrodite flower, you have the staminate flower, you can identify the hermaphrodite flower by the ovary, okay? So the ovary is there, and then the other, the corolla, 
and the calyx they resemble similarly in the staminate flower also okay now uh, these uh, flowers or the uh, muskmelon flowers are visited by uh, apis floria apis flora uh, dark sarana apis dorsata all these three are honeybee you know and they are also visited to some extent by some solitary bees like seretina and lasioglossa but more frequently they are visited by the honeybees so honeybees especially apis sarana and apis floria are the most frequent visitors so we concentrated all of our studies on these three, these two bees so this is apis floria and this is apis sarana now the questions that we asked at the beginning is that why staminate flowers are produced when hermaphrodite flowers are there when both the when the anther is produced in the same flower where the stigma is there why the staminate flowers are produced separately or pollen from hermaphrodite flowers and those from staminate flowers the same in structure viability and fertility so this is another thing that we have about and the third one is if not if the pollen from hermaphrodite flowers and staminate flowers are different then what is the what, what is the purpose of the main part in the hermaphrodite flower why it is there so these are some basic questions that we asked when we started working on this so when we looked at the ratio between the staminate and the hermaphrodite flowers you see that the ratio is 18 is to 1 so for every one hermaphrodite flower there are 18 staminate flowers so this this is the uh, thing and um, when you're looking at when you look at when you compare the pollen from staminate and hermaphrodite flowers in, in terms of abundance you see that the staminate flower produces not more pollen pollen grains compared to the hermaphrodite flowers so it is almost double the number of pollen that is produced in hermaphrodite flower in a staminate flower and when you are looking at the viability of the pollen the viability of the pollen and the both are actually viable so the viability of the staminate the pollen from the staminate flower is significantly higher it's about 43% whereas yeah, that of hermaphrodite flower is about 31% so this is this, this is the but the most interesting thing is when we compare the pollen tube growth the pollen rate of pollen tube growth or the pollen tube length uh, you see that the stem the pollen from the staminate flowers it grew faster and longer it it went up to about 7.9 micrometer compared to the pollen from pollen tube from the pollen of hermaphrodite flower which is about just about 1.1 it was very slow and then it is only about 1.1 micro micro uh, meters now the style length the, the distance from the stigma to the first ovule in the flower is about 6.5 micrometer so it is very clear that it is the pollen from the staminate flower only is capable of fertilizing the ovules in the hermaphrodite flowers and the stamen the pollen from the hermaphrodite flower will not be able to fertilize the uh, the, the ovules in, in the same flower so this we wanted to actually test so for testing this uh, we did an experiment uh, in which we had several treatments with open pollination selfing hagging then pollen from hermaphrodite flower then pollen from staminate flower so in open pollination we had we did not observe anything it was the station by the bees then in selfing we used the pollen from the same hermaphrodite flower and then self the flower and in bagging it it it, it is for preventing any uh, Uh, any visitor then pollen from another hermaphrodite flower is taken and put on the stigma of a different hermaphrodite flower to see if there is any effect and pollen from staminate flower so you see that the pollen from staminate flower was most effective in setting of the parts in the fruit sac compared to any other treatment and it is it was equal to uh, open pollination so hermaphrodite flowers that were pollinated using pollen from the same flower or from other hermaphrodite flowers did not result in fruit sac on the other hand with pollen from staminate flowers it resulted in 100% fruit sac so what is the purpose of pollen in hermaphrodite flowers why the pollen is being produced in hermaphrodite flowers this is the next question so we did some emasculation studies 
in which we removed, we selected the uh, hermaphrodite flowers, set the hermaphrodite flowers, and then we emasculated one set in which we removed the stamens before before the flower opened. And we, you find that the percent fruit set in a normal hermaphrodite flower is significantly more compared to the emasculated hermaphrodite flower, though it was nearly about 80 percent. But in, interestingly, the number of seeds produced is more significantly, highly significantly more in case of normal hermaphrodite flowers compared to the emasculated hermaphrodite flower. So why this difference? Why the difference in that number? So then we looked at the behavior of the bee. So when you see the behavior of the bees, you see that in uh, both Apis serrana and Apis floria, the honeybees, when they visit a normal hermaphrodite flower, they are spending more time compared to a emasculated hermaphrodite flower. So they spent nearly 10 seconds, 10.5 seconds, or 4 or 5 seconds in, the, in a flower, uh, in a normal hermaphrodite flower compared to a uh, emasculated hermaphrodite flower, they spent just about 2 seconds or less than 3 seconds. And the number of pollen deposited is also significantly higher in case of normal hermaphrodite flower compared to an emasculated hermaphrodite flower because they are spending least time in the uh, flower. So pollinators spend less time in emasculated flower and they, they spend more time and they also collect and they also collected the pollen that is there in the normal hermaphrodite flower. And that is one of the reasons why they were spending more time in like that. So interestingly, must not require including my species for pollinators. And the male part in the hermaphrodite flower possibly helps in retaining bees and improve the or the seed set. So this, this is an interesting adaptation that you can see for pollinators for increasing the interest of the pollinator to stay more time inside the flower so that it deposits more pollen than it has got from the staminated flowers. I think I'll move on to the next uh, example before we take a break for questions. Wet hedging in sunflower, in sorry, in sun hemp, local area, Jinshia. Uh, sun hemp, you all know, is an important forage for forage crop. And I'd like to tell something about wet hedging before before that. So wet hedging is something like we, we are always advised not to put all your eggs in one basket because the possibility of some, something happens to the basket where all the eggs will, will be lost. So a plant that produces a lot of seeds in one go, some seeds germinate immediately while a few remain dormant for a considerable time. That increases the chances of survival in case there is a drought. So this improves the fitness of the species. So many species, they have this kind of bedhead phenomena or character so that they survive. In spite of uh, severe drought, they survive because some seeds germinate late. So this, this is one thing. But how is it important from the point of view of pollinating? So coming to the crop, the sun ham, Crotalaria Asia, this is also from tropical Asia. It grows about, this is also a fabulous plant like the vision peak, 2.5 to 3.5 meters high it grows. It, it is mainly cultivated for green manure, water and fiber. It is a possible source of biofuel also. And in India, we grow in an area of 35,000 hectares. 25 tons per hectare is used as green matter and 15 tons per hectare is used as uh, forage, so it has a lot of a lot of uses also, and it is very popular in many parts of southern India and also in uh, western India. Now, when you come to the flower structure, you see that the terminal it is a terminal racemose in raceme inflorescence. Flowers are complete zygomorphic pentamerous, five fused petals, five three, three petals, and ten free stamens in two folds. So this is this is an interesting thing. The stamens are in two holes. They are dimorphic. They are of different sizes. The first hole, or the outer hole, of five stamens with long anthers, and on short filaments. This we call as short stamens. And the second one is the hole of five stamens, globose, uh, globose anthers on long slender filaments. So this we call as a long stamen. So you have two sets of stamens 
long statements and short statements in the two two heights. So this is an interesting thing. Why again? Now the flower of sun it lasts for three days. Okay. So first we wanted to see whether the pollen will be viable for all the three days, whether the stigma will be receptive in all the three days, until 72, 72 hours, for 72 hours, whether it is, it will be receptive. So when we did some hand pollinated studies, you we found that the stigma is receptive, is receptive on all the three, equally receptive on all the three days, and the pollen is viable on all the three days. So that is, that is the reason why it is open for three days. So this is the first thing. And another interesting thing that we found was the difference between the pollen from the short stamen and the long stamen. When we looked at the uh, viability of the pollen on different days, we found that on the first day up to 24 hours, the, the pollen from the short stamen is viable, very high, highly viable. And then by the second end of the second day, 48 hours, the pollen viab the viability of the pollen from the short stamen reduces and it, it comes to very low level by the third day. Whereas the pollen from the long stamens, it, it is less viable on the first day, up to about 24 hours. And by end of 24 hours, the viability increases to about 55%. And then it increases by 48 hours to 84% 84, 84 and reaches about 87.8% by the third day. So initially, it is the pollen from the short stamen which is viable, and on the second and third day, it is the pollen from the long stamen which is viable. Which is viable. So this is a very interesting to know why this is so. So when we look, took the pollen, whether they are whether the parts actually set, the parts set after selfing the pollen from short and long stamens, you see that the pollen from short stamen is more viable compared to the pollen from the long, long stamen. So, uh, and compared to the overall, in some, in selfing, you always find the higher uh, level of uh, set. So you see that the pollen from the short stamen is more viable compared to pollen from long stamen. That does not mean that the pollen from long stamen is not viable. So the visitors are again megachylids. So megachyl bicolor, megachyl lanata. So these are the two species which actually visit and we have, I've already told you about the behavior, how it takes the nectar, how it comes in contact with the, um, with, with the um, the hairs on the abdomen when it takes the nectar and all that, how the pollination is affected. Now, <clears throat> very another very interesting thing is the filaments of the short stamen and the long, long stamen, sorry, the filaments of the short stamen and the long stamen and the style, they continuously grow with the age of the flower. So in the bud stage, the, the filament or the, the style is about um, say about 16 millimeters, whereas in in the, the both the short and the long stem and filaments will be about the same size, about five millimeters. Sorry. And uh, about 24 hours later, you see that the long stem is increasing in the in in its uh, length, and by 48 hours it has increased further, and by 72 hours it has crossed the length of the style. Okay, so it continuously grows, whereas the short stamen stops growing. It does not grow further. Okay, so the long stamen increases in its length by the third day to the maximum, to almost to the level of the style. So the interesting thing here is when you completely bag uh, uh, under the bagged condition. So when you are not allowing any uh, any visitation, then also. Sunamp is capable of setting nearly about 55%. 55% of the parts are set and nearly about 25 parts are retained. That means it is completely fertilized and the parts are retained. Whereas in the open, you see nearly 80% setting and about 60% or 56% or 58% retained. The parts are retaining. So part set and part retention with and without pollinator visitation. Now, the interesting thing here is if the pollinators are not visiting, due to some reason, if the pollinators are not visiting in nature, the sunflower, sun hemp is still capable of setting nearly 50% of its seeds. 
Okay, so that is the interesting thing. So sun hemp, due to some reasons, if the pollinator is not available, supposing the sun hemp is cultivated in an area where the pollinator is not there, where the megakaryotes are not there, megakaryote nesting sites are not there, and the activity is not at all there, the plant can still survive by and reproduce by delayed self-pollination. This is what is called as delayed self-pollination. Hence, this is an excellent example for bed hedging in plant kingdom. I think now I'll stop, give another break for questions. Before I go to conservation. Yeah, any questions? No questions? No questions? No, sir. Okay, then. then I'll move on to conservation of bees. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know that there are an estimated 2,95,383 species of flowering plants in the world. And according to Allerton, uh, who published a paper in 2011, 87.5% of flowering plant species entirely are partially depend on flower visitors for successful seed set. Now, if you look at the Indian condition, you see that 21,411 species of flowering plants are there and 16,000 species require pollinating agents. This is according to the Envis Center for Floral Diversity Report of 2018. Now, uh, 80, uh, we, cult we cultivate about 115 crops or plant, plant species for our foot. All over the world. So 87 of the 115 global food crops depend upon insects for pollination. 35% of global food production is attributed to uh, pollinators. Okay, so the 87 of the 115 global food crops directly or indirectly, completely or partially, they depend on insects for pollination, most of them being bees. And 35% of the total global food production is attributed for pollinators and mainly bees. Now, the annual economic value of pollination service worldwide is about 577 billion US dollars. Okay, this has been estimated recently. This is not 2009, it is 2016. I'm sorry, it's a uh, wrong uh, data I've given, Galai 2016. So this, this is the annual economic value of pollination service worldwide is about 577 billion US dollars. Now, do we give any value for pollinators in spite of this? Pawan Sukhdev, uh, an economist with the United Nations, in one of his reports, he has written that not a single bee has ever sent you an invoice, and that is part of the problem because most of what comes to us from nature is free because it is not invoiced, because it is not priced, because it is not traded in markets, we tend to ignore it. So whatever for whatever thing which we are not paying anything or which is not priced, we ignore it. We consider it as a free ecosystem service. So we take pollination for granted. Now, in 2011, a group of uh, pollination biologists led by Fatih Basu from Calcutta University, they published a very interesting paper in which they actually classified all the cultivated crops into three groups, pollinator independent crops, which did not, which do not depend on any pollinators like most of our cereals, and crops which depend on pollinators and crops which are highly dependent on pollinators. So these are, they, these are the three uh, categories that they made. And then they looked at the productivity, increase in productivity over years. And they found that all those crops which are, which are not dependent on pollinators, they, they found actually there, is a, there was a steady increase in the productivity. This is mainly because of the efforts by the breeders, by the plant breeders, who actually identified new genotypes with higher yielding capabilities, and that is how we, we could get higher yields. But the same breeders are working with those crops with which depended on pollinators also but that is not happening there is a stagnation in the yield from 1980s onwards okay this has been there the pulse production the oil seed production so all these there is a there is, there is a stagnation this probably is 
because that we are not recognizing the importance of pollinators here. So probably if we conserve pollinators and then enhance the pollinator pollinators also, we can in, in, in fact realize higher yields in all these crops also. So how to justify conserve for conservation of pollinators? So that is the next question. So for that, we have to do what is called as an economic valuation of pollination service. So how, how is this done? We have to identify the crop and we know what is the total area under cultivation and what is the annual production, the total production in the, in the area, if you are considering a state or uh, a particular uh, area or, or include, include the complete country. And what is the price per unit produce? So we, what is the call? What, what is the price that we are getting for unit, unit produce? And we have to work out what is called as the pollinator dependency index. So what is the pollinator that it is depending on that? And if the pollinator is not there, what is the loss in the yield that we experience? Other, all other things being constant. So how do you work out pollination dependency index? There is a need for detailed studies on pollination biology of the crop selected, that this basic information is necessary. Then pollination efficiency of flower visitors, you have to work out which is the most efficient pollinator. There may be visit, it may be visited by several visitors. There may be one or very few species which are important as pollinators. And identify the most efficient pollinator and conduct exclusion experiments to determine the actual role of pollinators. What is the actual increase in pollination if it is partially dependent on a pollinator. So what happens if it is 100% dependent on a pollinator if the pollinator is not there? What is the setting, whether it is zero or it is, it, it, it is minimal? So the pollinator dependency index has been worked out for uh, in general by the FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization. So if there is no difference, if there is no difference with whether the pollinator is there or not, then the index is zero. That means for most for cereals, which do not depend on uh, pollinators, whether the pollinator is there or not, it doesn't make any difference. And if it is very little, then it is 0 0.05. That is five to 10% increase only is there in the presence of pollinators. Modest is 0 0.25 if the, if the increase in the yield is between 25 and 40%. And high, it is 0 0.65 if the increase in the yield is about, is between 50% to 80% and essential, it is more than 80%, it is 0.95. So these are, these are the indices that is used for working out the ec economics. So we do the pollinator exclusion experiments as I just explained in the previous examples, with and without pollinators, set of plants to be enclosed in cages, a similar set left for open pollination, number of flowers produced, number of fruits or pots or seeds set, percent difference in set between the two treatments. So this is the basic data for every crop that we need. And it is expressed as a fraction of one, okay? Now, the productivity and production, area and production of the crop to be obtained from published sources. You need not go and then survey the area. There are a lot of published information like the FAO reports are there, national production reports are there. Then the Indian Council of Agriculture Research publishes reports on various institutes. Then the State Department of Agriculture reports are there about the area and production. And the only thing is you should have a basis for your data. So you should say that this is the source of information. And the area is multiplied by the productivity. So that gives uh, the, the production. So the productivity of the crop, you know, the mean productivity for the entire state or the entire country is taken into consideration and it is multiplied by the area that, that is under that particular crop. Now, the economic valuation of pollination service can be done for an individual crop, a group of crops. It can be for a state, it can be for a zone or region, it can be for the country or for the entire world as, as it has been done by the FAO. So the economic valuation is calculated by multiplying the pollination dependency index with the total value of the crop. So the total value of the crop is is the annual production, the total production multiplied by the unit price. So PDI is the pollination deficient, uh, dependency index multiply, and it is multiplied by TVC, that is total value of the commodity or total value of the crop. 
So with muskmelon, we have done this uh, for several crops that we have done this, and for muskmelon and another another crop, I'll just mention this: the total production in India is nine lakh sixty-two thousand tons. The unit price is thirty-two thousand rupees per ton. Per ton. Pollination dependency is 0.95 because muskmelon, you know that it is andromonaceous and it depends on pollinators. If, if there are no pollinators, there is no set. So the total value of the production is 3,078 crores of rupees and the value of the pollination service is 2,925 crores. So this is attributed only to the service that is given by the bees, by the honeybees. Now, in case of pigeon pea, the total production is 46 lakh tons. Unit price is 53,000 rupees per ton. And pollination dependency is 0.25. I've taken it as 0.25 because it is capable of setting seeds even without the service of pollination. It is capable of self-pollination. And then the total value of the production is 24,380 crores. And the value of pollination service is 6,095 crores. Similarly, we have done for some selected crops, I'll give it in a table, like cardamom, coffee, then pigeon pea and muskmelon I just mentioned, bitter gold, brinjal, goa, and many other crops that we have done. And if you take just these seven crops, you'll see that the total value of the pollination service comes to about 29,207.68 crores of rupees. So in spite of all this, we take pollination for granted. Now, working out economic value of pollination service is important for conserving pollinators because we have a basis for telling that we need to conserve pollinators, for conserving their nesting habits, for conserving biodiversity, and for convincing policy makers. So if we want to convince policy makers, we have to talk to them in terms of rupees, in terms of money, then only they will, they will, they will agree that, oh, yes, yes, this, this is important and we need to take action on this. Now, there is a very interesting thing that at the end, I would like to uh, mention this. In June 2010, a Whole food store in Rhode Island, as part of a campaign to highlight the importance of bees, temporarily removed from its produce section all the food that depended on pollinators. Okay, so this was before, before removing the food that depended on pollinators. And uh, when they removed, they actually... Uh, 237 items vanished, including many fruits, vegetables, and spices. And the whole store became nearly half the store became empty. Okay, because we, And this very clearly shows that bees are the glue that holds our agricultural system together. This was written by the journalist Hannah Nordhaus in her 2011 book, The Beekeeper's Lament. I think that is the last slide that I have. And this is my team of students who work with me on various projects. Uh, most of the field work is done by my students. So I, I should uh, acknowledge their help. And many of them are also authors in many of the papers that we have published. Thank you. So now it's open for questions. Yeah. 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 Uh, so then, uh, so, uh, some beekeeping plants, uh, best beekeeping plants we need to talk about. Yeah, now, now the thing is, uh, there is what is called as the awareness for landscape management. Uh, uh, in, in fact, uh, 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 you have to identify in any given area, you have to first identify the flora and you have to see what are all the flowers that are visited commonly by the bees and then you should take up conservation measures so that is that is uh, one important thing so there are many species many i, I don't think i can any name any particular beekeeping plant like that uh, there are many weeds and many species of plants uh, like antigona and many others which are very uh, important for bees and only thing is if you are cultivating a crop which is dependent on the bees for pollination, you can see that the, the, the plants that you have outside the field does not compete with your uh, target crop. So you should know, you, you should develop what is called the floral calendar for a given area. The floral calendar is developed and then you, you see which are the plants that you should encourage in, in the field. So that's how it is. I can send you a list if you, if you need. There's a list of nearly some 200 species of plants there. Yeah. 
sir uh, plant could, uh, could they recognize the uh, each every each flower sir uh, each flower in a plant in the same yeah. plant because yeah. uh, they are visiting again and again yeah. what they have already pollinated before uh, oh, they, uh, it, it is an interesting uh, question the uh, bees actually they you know that all these bees whether they are solitary or social they have a nest okay so they have first built a nest and then they have come to the uh, place where they are collecting the pollen or nectar okay so they have to actually depend their root I mean remember their root back to the nest okay so that is the reason why they come back that is what is called as fidelity okay they come back to the same plant the same type of flowers they will be visiting and that is the reason why uh bees are excellent pollinators because they repeatedly visit the same kind of flowers and so they are excellent pollinators so this is this is probably a uh, what is about as a memory constraint that they have that they have to uh, remember their root back come back and then go back to the same nest uh, so like that so that is there sir uh, our practice also is uh, different right we are we are uh, depending on more of uh, more of a uh, monoculture mm -hmm. plant actually uh, yeah. sugar and uh, yeah. uh, what are we are do, doing uh, 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 rice and everything is based on it so uh, uh, so food our food what are you saying is positive aspect of it uh, yeah. and everything but diversify, uh, diversify the cropping pattern also yeah uh, we are saying to diversify that yeah uh, what would what would be the uh, uh, what policy making thing uh, that would change this thing? Uh, the, uh, the thing is because uh, you can't uh, do away with the cereals and uh, others because most most of what we do depend on uh, cereals but we also should encourage uh, the other crops instead of depending on importing the other crops because uh, we do have a lot of vegetables a lot of fruit crops which are dependent on pollinators so it, it is very essential that we encourage that also and there are there are, there are many many places where they are uh, growing these crops there, there, there are certain uh, pockets you find only the rice growing and then the wheat growing areas, which do not need pollinators. We need not worry about those crops. So the crops which are growing pollinators, we have to conserve pollinators for those crops. It's very important. And sir, uh, uh, yeah. most of the environmentalists now, uh, a few years back, they have been writing that militarized uh, like people they have introduced in India. Yeah. And, uh, there were this local population of uh, Indica where they used to pollinate uh, paradigm flowers, where they use, uh, like, which used to flower in the June, July of the flowering season uh, during the rainy season. So, this Mellifera kind it of not work. Yeah. introduced uh, species, brought uh, the other viruses mm. or viral diseases too, which infected the Indica. So, how much part of this is true? Uh, no, I'm not. I am not going to comment on the virus part of it. Okay, <laughs> but introduction of uh, mellifera has caused problems of competition for the local for local bees. Okay, uh, and in in cardamom, as you said, in cardamom, yeah, uh, sarana indica is a better pollinator than uh, mellifera. And in fact, when it is raining heavily. Still, the Sarana bees are active, but not the but not Malifa. And if you go to the north, in uh, say to Haryana and Punjab, you find the Malifera, Malifera colonies are dominating there because most farmers they keep Malifera colonies because it is easier to handle. That is that is the thing. And the natural populations of Sarana is coming down in those, in those places. So that is that is true. But I am not very sure about the trans transfer of the virus and, and other things. I am not sure about. So in fact, there is also a, um, some kind of a thinking that is going on to introduce uh, bumblebees from other countries. We have nearly 53 species of bumblebees in India and why we should not use the same species. In fact, I was against in one of the meetings when they started, when they wanted to, when an Israeli company wanted to uh, introduce uh, bumblebees for uh, the, the tomato and uh, brindle pollination in, uh, in the greenhouses. We have several species and we do not know what will happen, whether those species which are introduced will survive in the first place or whether they, if they are, if they go out, what happens, we don't know. So that is the, so introducing a new species is always bad. Uh, sir, uh, uh, 
have to conserve the urban free population. They are more vulnerable to the extinction. Pardon? Repeat the question, please. How to conserve the urban bee population? Yeah. yeah, of course, urban bee uh, is very, very uh, important. Also, you have in urban areas a lot of gardens, and you have the um, say um, places which are vacant, okay, where there are no buildings or anything. So, in all those places, if there are some weeds that are going, or if somebody can plant something, it actually in fact, we had a, a recent study in which we, we in which we com compared actually in Bangalore uh, urban diversity of bees in urban and rural areas. In fact, we have higher diversity in urban areas compared to the rural areas because in rural areas we have in rural areas in the sense adjacent to Bangalore, a lot of vegetables are cultivated and a lot of pesticides are used there, and the diversity is naturally low there compared to urban areas where the diversity of plants also is higher. In urban areas so this it is there in fact people should recognize and now there is a lot of kitchen gardens that are coming rooftop gardens are coming root, rooftop cultivations are coming so people are aware about the conservation of this yeah I, I agree with this positive aspect of the urban population but when, when you study the pollutions they yeah. the, even though the diversity of the bees are uh, higher in the urban area yeah. their yeah. lifespans are getting reduced because of so this i completely agree with that i completely agree with that uh, so the pollution levels are uh, more. So you should have some pockets within the urban areas, like like uh, I don't know whether you know, uh, Bangalore was once called as the Garden City of India, but still there are parks. You, you know there are thousands of parks, small and large parks in 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 these things. But I think somebody has to take up a survey of all these parks to see how many bees are there, whether there is differences in the in the bees which are closer. To, there is one student who has started working on that. Which are which are closer to uh, the most polluted uh, areas, and then which are at the uh, say the um, say end of the city or the border of the city, uh, whether we have more species. These kind of studies are important. Sir, I have uh, one more question. Like, yeah. We know that plants evolved uh, many strategies to attract or lure the pollinators. Yeah. So, like from uh, uh, increasing the nectar volume or increasing the super concentration. Yeah. I was wondering and curious about how these orchids they evolved such a strategy to do things. Yeah, that is that is what is called as I didn't cover on that. It's called deceptive pollination. You no, know? uh, orchids uh, they there are several species like that. There are several species of orchids and there are several other species of plants also, which resort to deceptive, deceptive pollination, where they tend to produce a chemical which is similar to the chemical of. Uh, of an inter interest to a particular group of insects. So they think that, that for example, there are some orchids which produce uh, a chemical which is similar to the pheromone of a uh, wasp. And the male wasp, thinking that there's a female that, that is very close and then tries to mate with the orchid and then it pollinates. That it does not get anything without giving any reward, it, it does that. So these are all through the process of, it must have taken millions of years for evolution. But these are all chance factors which have, which have uh, evolved. And there are many species of orchids. So there, is, there is one species of orchid which is pollinated by the wasp. Okay? Um, yeah, you know, Vespa tropica, you know, the, the yellow banded wasp, okay? which, which constructs very huge nests. It, it, in fact, it, it attacks uh, honeybee colonies. Okay? It attacks honeybee colonies and then it takes the uh, larva and pupae of the honeybees and then it predates on that. It takes back to its nest like that. There is an orchid in the Western Guards which actually produces a chemical which is very similar to the alarm pheromone of the honeybees. Okay. And this last, thinking that there's a bee colony, it goes and then uh, it tries to search for the uh, larvae of the honeybees and thereby it is visiting all the flowers and then it is pollinated. So, this is a wonderful uh, mechanism that is Nature is wonderful. You just have to go out and then speak. That's all. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Okay. I I if there are no questions, thank you. Thank you very much for the thank you, sir. Thank you for the lecture. <laughs> I was a professor has gone for an interview selection, sir. Okay, it's okay, sir. No problem at all. Yeah. Uh, very fascinating to have you, sir. Uh, in our thank center. You, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Thank I you. like the interactions also. Yeah, yeah sir. Yeah, sir. Yeah.
Okay. In our center, we used to conduct uh, uh, further more workshops in coming. Uh, we would like to have you in uh, at Padre Kamaraj University, sir. Madam, sir. <laughs> yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you.